Good morning. Welcome to the Long Live Alternative Parties podcast. Free Press Media Press Inc. and Alternative Parties Books Publisher sponsors this podcast. I'm Andrew Bouchard. Welcome to the Long Live Alternative Parties podcast. Today we have another exciting guest who's going to talk about some more exciting stuff. Her name is Jacqueline. Abernathy of the American Solidarity Party, and she's running for governor of the great state of Texas. Welcome to the podcast, Jacqueline. Thank you. Glad to be here. Jacqueline, let us get started by you kindly giving us an introduction to yourself, a brief biographical sketch. Okay. Um, Well, I am a native Texan. I've been here my entire life. Uh, Background, professionally, I started out as a social worker and then noticed some things about Texas health policy that I just couldn't abide and wanted to change, which led to me getting a master's degree in social work and then a PhD in public policy solely for the purpose of um, politics and advocacy. So I've been working in politics, particularly in Texas, uh, since uh, 2003. Um, But professionally, I was a professor in the A&M system for a while. Um, I just recently, for family reasons, had to move to San Antonio, so I had to leave my position at Charleston State in Fort Worth. Um, and I am back to doing nonprofit work, uh, nonprofit consulting evaluation and that sort of thing. I am a wife and mother and uh, been a member of the American Solidarity Party for the last, I would say, four years. Well, my. So your public policy PhD, was that under a political science program or was that under sociology? What was the field that was there under? Public administration. It was public administration. My, the, the actual name of the degree is public administration and management. Um, okay. But my emphasis was on public policy, particularly public health policy. And I did a lot of my coursework uh, for any electives that I could choose on my own at the University of North Texas Health Science Center, their uh, Master's of Public Health program, uh, to, because my emphasis is primarily uh, in the public health Goodness, I hope everything's okay. Yeah, it's just a fire truck going somewhere. So you said your, your emphasis is on what? Public health policy, particularly, I'm, I, I work in advocacy uh, for persons with disabilities, those that are le- um, terminally ill, chronically ill. Um, oh I'm against, I'm, uh, I work to protect their right to receive medical treatment that would be taken from them by virtue of having a disability or because some people believe their lives are less worth living than others. So I, I work um, in... Um, Dispute between healthcare providers and patients when the provider says, I don't want to provide a feeding tube, and the patient or the patient's family says, yes, I want one. Um, I'm an advocate for the family in those cases. Um, I'm actually on the registry for the state of Texas for the uh, Department of Health and Human Services uh, as uh, a resource that people can call when there is a dispute and they need help finding a transfer for their loved one. Oh, my. So how has this experience you've had in these fields, how has that informed your political views? Um, my professional experience is, is kind of fun <laughs> because it's, I, I consider it the opposite. I don't consider that my professional experience informing my political views. I really feel like um, I mold my professional experiences around what needs to happen politically. And in fact, so much that... I did not start looking for jobs the way you know, all of my other fellow PhD graduates do when you, you know, got in the job market, cast a wide net, and end up a, you know, visiting professor somewhere, postdoc somewhere else. I instead went to Michigan because Ontario was the only place in the world that has a dispute policy close to what Texas has. And I couldn't live in Canada for immigration reasons, so it was either Buffalo, New York, or Detroit, Michigan. So I moved up there, took a job at the University of Michigan Dearborn temporarily, just to do research to get ready for the legislative session to come. Uh, so I've basically, my work exists to serve advocacy through politics. It's, um, it's not the other way around. It's not that my work is necessarily informed my political views as much as I 
have these values and convictions, and I make my work conform to that. Interesting. So kindly tell us what led you to the American Saudi Dairy Party in particular. What experiences led you there? Um, you know, it's, it, this is a great question because this is a question that we ask each other when we have meetups. And oh my. there's no common answer. You'll, you'll find people that started out way, way progressively left. And you'll find people that started out, you know, very much on the right. And so people seem to come to what I consider the common ground, common sense, basic decency middle <laughs> um, from so many different extremes. And where it was with me was that I've my values have always been the same when it comes to the innate dignity of human life. I am opposed to violence from since that to the national death. So that means I, I'm opposed to embryonic stem cell research. I'm opposed to abortion. I am opposed to um, euthanasia, the death penalty, um, physician-assisted suicide. So this, these have always been my convictions. And I had a major shift back in 2012. And that was when Romney uh, and Paul Ryan were running against Barack Obama. And they made it a point to campaign on their abortion restrictions. So I had naively believed that, you know, you know people don't support killing children. Pro-lifers don't support killing children that are conceived in incest. They just see that as a necessary compromise they have to make to save the other 99% of children. And that this is kind of, you know, a, a sad concession that we're making. And yet, I want a commercial where Mitt Romney had this woman that said, I heard that Mitt Romney is extreme on abortion. He's actually okay with abortion in cases of flavored incest. And isn't the economy more important? And it goes, I'm Mitt Romney, and I approve this message. And I said, huh, did you just campaign out of both sides of your mouth? So are you huh. campaigning for pro-lifers? Vote for me because I'll save babies. And then you're campaigning to those people that don't necessarily like that, by saying, oh, but it's okay, I'm okay with continuing to kill these babies that are no different than the other babies that are supposedly so important that they deserve saving. They're, I mean, they're fundamentally, there's, there's no difference between these human beings, except the conception, the circumstances of their conception have no bearing whatsoever on their, their worth and value and their personhood. And it got even worse when Paul Ryan did a debate, the vice presidential debate, and abortion came up. And he made it a point to talk about accepting cases of rape and incest, which completely undermined everything that, that he had said about why he was pro-life. Okay, if you're pro-life because, you know, this is a distinct individual for conception, that it's a human being with human rights, then explain how you're okay with accept and rape and incest. It does not work. And I just could not reward that kind of, I couldn't, that was unconscionable to me. I could not reward someone like that with my vote. Hmm. And, and this is despite the fact that Barack Obama had done a lot of things when it came to um, the abortion side of things that Romney would not have done. It, so I, there were things that Romney would have done that would have indeed saved lives on that front. But I said, I just cannot, I can't morally bring myself to vote. For, for somebody that is buying votes, exploiting unborn children and the danger they're in, so people that care about them or concerned for them will vote for them, and then also um, buying votes from those people that are concerned that they won't be able to have an abortion if, you know, they're ever raped. It doesn't work that way. And so that's when I decided that I was officially done with what we call the duopoly. <laughs> Um, at that point, I'm like, okay, I um, certainly can't vote Democrat, but um, I'm not finding any Republicans I can vote for either. I did not know about the American Solidarity Party. Uh, so my protest vote was a a very crazy fundamentalist guy, um, a, a pro-lifer that's kind of extreme. <laughs> um, when, talking about, like, religious right um, extreme. Um, when it comes to, and he's pro-death penalty, ironically. 
Um, but I wanted to make it really clear that my vote was for him was because I don't consider Mitt Romney for life. And same thing happened back in 2016 when it was Trump. So I wanted to make it very clear that, you know, why I have to vote. It's my civic duty. Women suffered. My foremother suffered and gave up so much so I would have this right. And I absolutely need to exercise it. Um, but I wanted to make it clear why I was not voting for either Hillary or Trump. And shortly after, that's when I found the American Solidarity Party. And they're completely consistently pro-life um, on everything. And even when it's not like a direct life issue, when it's things like not exploiting laborers, um, protecting the environment. Uh, so they, and they basically encapsulate all of my values and everything I stand for. So how would you describe them to somebody who never heard of them before? Would you would you elaborate on how you describe them in addition to what you've already said and mentioned about the consistency in its life views? Some would call that consistent life ethic. So how would yes. you describe it to someone that would hear about it for the first time? Um, it, well, in shortest terms, we don't kill anybody, which makes us very distinct from both Republicans and the Democrats. We don't kill anybody. Uh, we're not in favor of killing anyone. Um, and I, I feel like that alone stands out. Uh, beyond the consistent life ethic issue, we believe in equity, justice, and fairness. We are in favor of stewardship of the environment, uh, protecting the earth. We are in favor of tax policies that don't overburden the poor. Um, we are in favor of policies that that strengthen the family and do not interfere with, with human flourishing. So we would like to see reforms made to the way marriage is, is dealt with, the way divorce is, is handled. Uh, we would like to see changes there. We would like to see changes uh, when it comes to taxation and benefits for those that need help. Um, so I would consider us pretty economically liberal okay. um, and, and yet socially conservative. But in every case, you know, you, socially conservative, I, in fact, I feel like I need to have a big disclaimer asterisk on that. It's kind of like you can't say socially conservative without people thinking that you're anti-LGBTQ. Um, and that's not the case with us at all. Um, we're, we support um, non-discrimination, fairness, kindness, human dignity for everyone, regardless of sexual orientation. Uh, so, yeah, we're socially conservative, um, but we are not at all involved in the culture wars that you currently see, especially the ones here in Texas, when it comes to um, critical race theory and the like. Well, that's good. So since you're running for Texas governor race, how are you planning on implementing your party's vision in this race? And God willing to get elected, how would you change things with your party's vision? Oh, wow. Um, how would I change things? Hmm. Uh, I, I like, look, there's how Texas works and there's the party. I'm trying to find a way to reconcile those into one single answer. Um, at my goal for the campaign, let's start there. My goal for the campaign is to make, to raise awareness. Man, that is the most trite sounding phrase in the world. <laughs> We're raising awareness. But it's true. I want to raise awareness that there are alternatives. Yes. I want those that are desperately seeking for a moral option to support to know that there is one. Because even though I've been a part of the American Solidarity Party for years now, we did not have one when it was Ted Cruz versus Ted O'Rourke uh, for that race. So who, who exactly was I supposed to vote for on that? Uh, I couldn't. I, I mean, I, you know, Ted O'Rourke is an abortion extremist. 
Uh, he's in favor of abortion to, for any reason whatsoever, through all nine months of pregnancy, even after viability. And Ted Cruz is Ted Cruz. Huh. And then um, unapologetically supportive of the completely depraved, cruel, sadistic immigration policies that the Trump administration put forth. Um, I was in a spot where I, I was looking for someone to vote for, and there there wasn't anyone. And I'm hoping that by running, that those that are looking for an alternative to Abbott or Beto will find me and, ergo, therefore, find the American Solidarity Party. There we go. That's my campaign. Those are, those are my goals for the campaign. Um, my, my goals in office um, would definitely be major changes to our fiscal policy. Uh, okay. When it comes to, I, I like that we are economically conservative. I like that we we don't carry a lot of debt. I like that we um, are not in need of a state income tax. That's good. Yes. I, I like to, I like that if we can live with our means. Um, but there is a lot of waste, a lot of excessive waste that that disturbing to me that needs to be redirected towards social programs because we have we have a choice. We can either pay to prevent social problems or we can pay to deal with the consequences of them. So, you know, the whole thing, build schools or build prisons, um, it, it, that's, it, it, there, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, not our failing to expand Medicaid, our failure to take care of kids in the child welfare system in the street, um, there's going to be more consequences for that, negative consequences for that. Uh, if we adequately funded programs for to encourage, you know, humans th- thriving and, and flourishing, then we would probably see that they pay for themselves. Instead, we focus on trying to cut benefits anywhere we can. Uh, we have a very um, disturbing set of criteria for who qualifies for disability in this state, for example. Oh, really? Um, yes. Um, there's any way that they can exclude someone, any way that they can put forth their false ideology that they're such thing that they deserving and undeserving for, I do not believe in that at all. Um, they're trying their best to make sure that no one that they think that doesn't deserve to get help doesn't get help. We put more effort and money into policing that than we would if we just helped people. It reminds me a lot of uh, other states that have done drug testing uh, for mm-hmm. welfare recipients that, okay, well, you have to take a drug test if you want to get your food stamp on your, in your state welfare. And they would end up spending more money doing these tests to end up maybe finding one person that no longer got their $80 a month in benefits because it was so important to make sure that, you know, drug addicts can't eat. I feel like as a state, we do a, a woefully inadequate job of taking care of our social safety nets, of our infrastructure when it comes to uh, elder care services, child services, I would like to see funding reprioritized towards those areas. So in addition to that, what else is on your platform for the race? Um, my platform and the ASP platform are the same. Oh, it's um, the same, okay. I do not I do not diverge or differ from the party as a whole, which I to me is just amazing because I my whole life I, I used to call myself El Queso Solo, uh, the cheese that stands alone, because I never yeah. really fit in anywhere with any particular you know group or ideology or whatever. I I would I was always had uh, caveats or nuances that were so significant that it kind of made me feel that no matter how much I had in common with with any particular group, I still didn't quite identify as one of them. 
Um, sure. That changed, by the way, when I became Catholic. <laughs> I am absolutely a cliche Catholic. Um, I, I, I'm surprised because, yeah, as, uh, b- before when I was a Christian, I had all these different doctrinal beliefs that didn't quite align with any uh, particular Protestant denomination. And now that I'm Catholic, I am super Catholic. Um, but I'm also, because the American Solidarity Party platform is based on Catholic social teaching, I think that is why I'm so aligned with it. I, sure. that it, it supports my values, it reflects my values. If it's not too personal, when did you become Catholic? It sounds like you didn't start that way, you came later in life. Was it fairly recently or was it um, a while ago? It was, hmm, it was a while ago. I was, I, you're never supposed to ask a lady her age, but I am 41. <laughs> and I was 26 when I became Catholic, 26 or 27. I, Okay, so it's been a little while then. Um, I was, oh wait, I was 27, I think. I, I, ah, I would have to do the math. Um, I used to, when my mom would actually do the math to figure out how old she was when I was a child, I always thought that was so ridiculous. Really, mom, you don't know how old you are? And I am huh. now that old that I do that. So I, um, but uh, I was, yeah, I was in my mid to late 20s, 26, 27. Um, I became a Christian. I was baptized. I was brought up. My parents baptized me in an Episcopalian church, and uh, my father and mother were Greek Orthodox. My father still is Orthodox. Um, My mother passed away. Um, But we didn't really live in a place where we could practice. We were in middle of nowhere, Texas, that was hours upon hours away from the nearest uh, parish, church, (laughs) that for for Orthodox. So... um, there was not a lot of uh, religious participation as much as we did when we lived somewhere closer. So, and uh, we moved to middle of nowhere, uh, in between Hillsboro and Corsicana, Texas, a town called Frost, which is fewer than 500 people from all the time that I grew up there. Um, I became a, I guess you would say, evangelical uh, when I was 19. That's when I gave my life to Jesus and decided to follow him. Uh, and eventually that led me to becoming a Catholic. So I still hmm. gave my life still belongs to Jesus and I still follow him. I just follow him now as a Catholic. Huh. Interesting. So briefly, how has your life changed when you went from evangelical to Catholic? Oh, man. Ah, oh, so many ways. So many awesome ways. Um, well, I, I assumed when I did this, I anticipated that I was going to be paying a pretty steep, heavy price. I was working at the deaconess level of leadership for a Protestant megachurch. And oh. they don't, you have to be on staff in order to have that job. And so here I'm like, I'm going to lose my job. And I wasn't so much concerned about losing my job as I was concerned that I wasn't going to going to finish the mission that I was on. I was called to be there for a very particular purpose. And and so here I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll have to find another job, but maybe I can still, like, volunteer to do it on the weekends. You know, maybe they can, you know, pay me as a contractor. I'm sure the people that come in and clean every so often, they aren't all members of the church. So I'm trying to figure – I was trying to figure out a way to to keep doing the work I was doing. I anticipated losing my job. I anticipated losing a lot of my friends. I, I thought that they were going to be worried about me and um, that they were going to believe things that I once falsely believed because I was just ignorant of what Catholic teaching really is and what, you know, practicing Catholicism really is. So I was afraid I was going to lose my job, relationships. I was afraid that even those that I didn't lose, it was going to change the nature of those relationships. I, I'm a godmother of nine. Um, but um, five of those are Protestant. They're oh you know, evangelicals. And I was so terrified that it was going to be, okay, uh, yeah, I love you, Jackie, you're great, but they would feel like they'd have to go behind me every time and say, okay, what did, what did she tell you? And, okay, well, we don't believe that. I, I mean, I was afraid that it was going to interfere and with related. I, I thought that there was going to be a lot of loss. Um, there was none. No, oh, I didn't lose anything. I gained everything, actually. I ended up oh, getting, they put me on contract so I could uh, only work for 15 hours a week for the same amount of pay. 
I was able to go back and do my PhD uh, at the same time um, and finish the job in record time because uh, we were, me being an outsider and then paying me by the hour, there was a lot more incentive to get people to cooperate. There was a lot more communication and um, administrative oversight. Uh, sure. So I finished the job I was called to do. I got a PhD. Uh, I didn't lose any, you know, I gained everything and I lost nothing. And then, of course, when you add the sacraments to your life, when you have a, a, a relationship with Jesus and then you add the the depth of the real presence of the Eucharist um, and all of these the spirituality that I did not have before, hmm. it, it, in, oh, it makes life so much better. It makes life so much harder. And so it's a definite change um, because there's expectations of you that don't exist but if you're not a Catholic. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, so it, yeah, it was, it was a big change, but um, I, I'm at this point where I just can't imagine. It's hard to remember what life was like before. Oh, my. Yeah, I've been a Catholic a- longer than I was not one. Interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting story you have. Oh, well, that was, uh, I didn't do it justice. That was the the Reader's Digest version of it. <laughs> but yes. like, something I'd like to, to make clear, um, I posted on my, my Facebook page uh, yesterday or the day before um, that I had just stumbled across news that Beto O'Rourke has tested positive for COVID-19. And I posted that I was, you know, please join me in praying for him and wishing him well and that I'm pleased to hear that he has gotten, he's fully vaccinated and got a booster. I have too, uh, because that makes it a lot more likely that this is going to be mild and uneventful. And and I ended it with, in Jesus' name, and it hit me. Hmm. You know, I speak for myself, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to hide my beliefs or convictions um, but we have a lot, we have a big problem in politics with using the Lord's name in vain in ways to suggest that God is somehow a supporter of any particular ideology, party, or candidate. Um, there's signs out there that say God, guns, and Trump, for example, um, as, as if God is okay with Trump doing things that he specifically told us not to do. Do not oppress the foreigner. Welcome the foreigner. The yes. exact opposite. Um, and it's basically, it's, 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 it is taking God's name in vain. It's exploiting um, and misrepresenting God as being partisan and partisan toward any particular candidate. I believe that if God did have a political party, it would be AFC. There's nothing in our platform. There's nothing in what we do that is an affront to uh, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, um, Christ's teaching. In everything that, that we do and stand for um, is aligned with Christianity. So, I mean, I believe that, you know, if God was going to pick a political party, I'd like to think that this is the only one he could pick because every one, other one is supporting some sort of intrinsic evil or another. Um, but even still, I, I feel like I need to be careful to not hide my light under a bushel, to, to not um, cease to be myself, but also to make it clear that I'm not presenting my political strategies, my political convictions, my ideas, as if I speak for God. <laughs> um, because I'm a big fan of the separation of church and state uh, sure. for the primary reason of protecting the church from the state. Hmm. Not because I you know, don't want the, the church imposing theology on the state, even though I don't, uh, religious freedom is a two-way street. And yes. if we want the ability to worship freely, we have got to give uh, those of different faiths, Muslims, um, 
those who practice Judaism, is, you know, all of this. We have to respect that and, and not infringe on their rights as well. But, yeah, so I'm a big supporter of a separation of church and state, and uh, it hit me after I, I posted that. It was just my sincere concern uh, for Mr. O'Rourke. Huh. We have to be, I feel like I have to be careful about what I say so it's not misconstrued as, is this person perhaps a theocrat? You know, is this person um, trying to promote a Christian ideology or agenda? I'm trying to promote a Judeo-Christian ethic when it comes to things, absolutely. Yeah, I, I believe in justice. I believe in morality. I believe in um, equality. But it's definitely not any sort of religious-based ideology. It's, it's sure. These are what I, these beliefs and these, policies that I support are based on my belief that they are the most effective way to have a thriving society, have a sure. fair, just, and thriving society. So do you and or the American Solidarity Party have a position on homelessness, how to address it? Um, yeah, we want to get people home. The problem is someone is homeless, as in they do not have a home and they need a home. Yes. Uh, there have been many, um, I don't want to say so, social experiments, but uh, policies where they basically, <laughs> other countries provided for the chronically homeless, they provided safe shelter. And it worked. In fact, it reduced the cost associated with homelessness uh, to actually just provide what they need rather than deal with the, the aftermath, the consequences of not having it. Um, the way I would deal with homelessness, absolutely, is to offer that. We, we should not, we are a country that is so obscenely wealthy, there's no reason whatsoever that we should have people without the basics of life. Yeah. I am deeply disturbed about uh, Greg, uh, Greg Abbott's assault, his all-out war last legislative session on the homeless, um, that they, you know, dare be homeless where he can see them because it makes him uncomfortable. And this whole idea of we can harass them, we can, you know, throw what little they have away, their tents, we can chew them because, you know, if they don't congregate in, in groups, then it looks like there are fewer of them, right? If they're just, you know, you see them Individually, it's different than when you see an entire group of homeless people. So uh, his desire to get rid of encampments, um, to essentially criminalize being homeless without providing them an alternative, exactly where are these people supposed to go? Yeah, they're under a bridge because there's where else are they supposed to go? And we need to provide what people need. Uh, we need to definitely do something about um, the housing market where we have a, a, a supply-demand issue, rents are getting out of control. Uh, I feel like people are on the verge of homelessness just because they can't afford their rent. Um, sure. We have an issue with zoning where we're not uh, creating enough uh, multifamily housing units, and instead we have a lot of McMansions, and there's not room uh, for everyone, and there's not affordable housing. I would like to see changes to that, too. Sure. So what is your strategy for reaching voters in this election? Oh, I, I'm hoping that by, by simply existing, those who are torn between O'Rourke versus Abbott will be able to find me. So my strategy is to reach them is making myself able to be found. Um, so I'm trying to reach out to groups that are, are sympathetic to the same concerns that I have. And um, it's a lot of word of mouth. We don't have money for advertising in a traditional sense. Um, I Interviews like this are certainly helpful, so thank you so much for having me. Sure. Uh, I, social media, I think, 
um, can get the word out there a little bit more. Um, so I, I'm kind of relying on just m making my presence known, uh, having a web presence, having a social media presence, and doing interviews like these where people can, if they're looking for an alternative, okay, alternative to Beto and Greg Abbott, click. I'm hoping that enough of that means that when they look for me, I'm able to be found. Yes, let's hope. So are you running this race by yourself? Do you have a team backing you up? How is the leadership working in your campaign? Well, um, I we have not had our state convention yet. Uh, okay. So I am the presumptive nominee. No one's uh, challenged that. Uh, but we still have to, this summer, officially um, make a motion to recognize me and officially make me the nominee for the party. Um, okay. I have uh, a – you spoke to my campaign manager, Brian Talbot. Um, I The local chapters here in San Antonio and in other parts of the state are, are very active and very helpful. Um, so we say I'm running alone. I'm actually, I was not planning to run. Running was not my idea. Um, oh, no. Interesting. Um, yeah. I, I, I remember saying distinctly, somebody has to, somebody has to run, somebody has to offer an alternative to what we have. And then I remembered it and went, oh, darn it. Every time I said somebody has to do something, it always ends up that that somebody is me. And I didn't realize at the time, like, it's going to be me, is it? Um, uh, that was, you know, a, a year ago, I think, that I, I started saying, we have a problem here. Um, and it was other people in the state, in state leadership, that came to me. And they said, would you be willing to run as, uh, with our support as an American Solidarity Party candidate? Uh, and my response is, okay, I am probably not the best choice just by virtue of logistics. I work full-time. I have uh, several small children. I just I don't have a lot of freedom and availability. I don't have, most people that decide to run for office tend to be wealthier. <laughs> um, they, they have the time and the money to put into it. I, I don't. I, I mean, I'm certainly can find someone better than, than me. And they pressed the issue, and, you know, I came to realize, okay, I, I may not have as much time as I want to have, but my primary goal of just making sure that there is an option that represents our convictions, because being silent is not okay. You know, being silent in the face of what's going on is not okay. Sure. Um, so, but also, we, you know, we can't support what exists. We have to have, there, there just had to be a, an alternative. So I'm able to be that alternative. And uh, they, my hope was, and I believe the reason why so many came to me was, you know, I was a Master's of Public Administration professor. Um, I have been working at the state level, uh, passing legislation in Texas since 2003. I've passed legislation in other states. Uh, when there is a lawsuit on the constitutionality of an abortion regulation, um, the attorneys general of the states that are uh, in the lawsuit tend to reach out to me, uh, and I'm state's witness, expert witness, to defend the constitutionality of laws. So that's Texas, Louisiana, Alabama. Um, so when it comes to policies and, and, and political experience, uh, I've got quite a bit. And so wasn't my idea to run, but I'm certainly glad I did it. And I really hope that the fact that, you know, I am educated and experienced in politics, even though I've never been before been a politician, I'm hoping that that uh, might inspire people uh, to consider voting their conscience for a while. Yeah. There's always a reason not to. When when it's uh, Trump versus Hillary or, 
you know, Trump versus just about anyone. <laughs> if there's this temptation, I feel, to, you know, vote for anyone that would, you know, make that um, nightmare come to an end. Uh, I feel like here in Texas, there are bad things being done by Abbott, and there's bad things that Better work would do. But I don't feel like there's as much at stake. I feel like maybe we can finally convince people in this case to vote their conscience and see how it feels. Like, see, how, you know, how, does it, how does it feel to vote for someone that you know is not going to promote violence against anyone? How does it feel to vote for someone and, and not wonder if you are somehow remotely compliant, complicit with some horrible thing that they're doing? Because even when I would vote at the state level for Republicans, because abortion is a, a, a state issue and abortion regulations save lives, so I tend to vote Republican at the state level um, because it, that's important. But I've never been able to do that without thinking, oh, my gosh, did I just put my stamp of approval on sending another innocent person to their death in the Texas justice system? Because I believe that we have executed innocent people by name. I can think of several by name that I believe were innocent. I, and I, I hated that. Like, I, I hated this, this trade-off of, okay, these lives versus these other lives. Because it's completely unnecessary and arbitrary. No one has to die. It might feel good to vote for somebody for once that is not asking for the legal right to kill any human being. Yes. So how can our audience support you in your campaign? Well, um, because this is a, we're going for ballot access. Uh, this is a okay. run-in campaign. We have a, we're trying to raise the filing fee um, right now. Um, and my website is abernathyfortexas.com where you can go. And we're going to have, um, we're going to be selling yard signs and um, bumper stickers and things like that to kind of get the my name out there for those that are, like, looking for an alternative. Because who knows if somebody might see one of these signs or stickers and then Google and see, oh, wait a second, that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, so I have a a store that is, in, in process um, where those things are going to be provided. Um, so the most important thing is raising the filing fee, but you can help us do that by purchasing things from the store that also, as an added bonus, uh, promote the campaign, get the word out there that there is an alternative, there's a pro-life alternative. Uh, so I'm, I'd also like those that have friends and family who are politically homeless, I would like it if they would – just mention that, hey, I understand that the, you know, the right has gotten so far right that you no longer identify with them anymore. Um, or I understand that you're pro-life and you're not comfortable with voting for Beto O'Rourke because he is an abortion extremist. Have you heard about the American Solidarity Party and that there is a write-in named Jacqueline Abernathy for the governor's seat? So I'm hoping that, that we can just get the word out there that way, too. Sure. Excellent. Excellent. Jacqueline, thank you kindly for coming on the podcast today and talking about all the exciting things that you've been doing. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My web website, by the way, is Abernathy for Texas, and Texas is not spelled out. It's just tx.com. And there you can learn more about uh, my stance on all the issues, uh, and there's a button to support the campaign. And I really hope that you will check it out. All right, Abernathy for Texas, TX.com. Yes. All right. Thank you kindly, and we wish you all the best in your campaign and all your other endeavors. Thank you. I appreciate this. This was, this was fun. I enjoyed being here today. Yes. Take care and all the best. You too.